Federalism is one of those mysterious terms in constitutional law that generally refers to the conflict between state governments and the national government. Um, but to really understand it, we have to understand what federal government means. Uh, it's really a new concept with our Constitution. The idea is, is that at any geographic point within the United States, you've got at least two governments that govern over you. In fact, basically two governments, if you don't count really local governments. Um, right now, for example, we're sitting in the Commonwealth of Virginia. It is a state well, among the 50 states. We're subject to all the laws of the state of Virginia, the Commonwealth of Virginia. And if we break them, then the Virginia State Police or maybe the local municipality, which is part of the state of Virginia, will, will come in and will, will enforce the law. Um, but simultaneously, at the exact same moment, un, you know, unavoidably, we're also in the United States of America, and we're subject to all the national laws. And if we break those laws, then maybe the feds will bust in here and arrest us. Uh, hope not, but it, it could happen. Now, clearly, when you've got two different sovereignties, when you've got a national government and a state government existing in exactly the same physical space, governing exactly the same people at exactly the same moment, there's a potential for conflict. Generally speaking, the Constitution resolves this through Article VI's Supremacy Clause, which, generally speaking, says if there's a conflict between national and state law, the national law prevails. But there's still a lot of ambiguity there. I mean, in fact, there's a whole body of law trying to figure out when such a conflict actually exists and when it doesn't exist and it, can it be avoided and all the rest of it. The first thing that is important to understand about the Constitution is that federal law is supreme. The Constitution contains a supremacy clause that basically says that the Constitution and all laws and treaties made under it are the supreme law of the land. And that means that states have to respect federal law. But that doesn't mean states have to embrace federal law. So often, states are pushing the envelope. They're trying to see what they can do. And you see it most clearly, for example, in the area of abortion regulation, where states, many states want to have restrictive abortion laws, and they, those laws get tested in the federal courts for whether they comply uh, with federal law. You also see it in the immigration area. Arizona passed a, 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 a comprehensive code about how uh, the police should interact with people they suspected of being illegally in the country, and the Supreme Court of the United States said that that conflicted with federal law and therefore it was preempted, and the state could not enforce those laws. So when state and federal law come into conflict, federal law prevails. All state officers are required to follow the strictures of federal law, whether it's in their day-to-day -day, um, interactions with people or whether it's in drafting legislation or making rules at the, at the local government level. So the federal law has to be respected. Um, but there is a great deal of room for state law that is, states, first of all, can always give people more rights than what the federal government wants. So if the state wants to interpret its own First Amendment to be more protective of speech than the federal uh, First Amendment, it can do that. If it wants to put more restrictions on police in terms of the right to privacy, uh, it can do that. And in terms of the Fourth Amendment, each state has its own analog to the Fourth Amendment. And some states interpret that to be exactly the same as the federal government's. Some states interpret it to be more restrictive. What states can't do is be less restrictive, because if the states are less restrictive, it would violate people's federal constitutional rights. All of this was by design, although a lot of it was also based on the facts on the ground as James Madison encountered them. The simple fact was the states preexisted the National Union. The states existed as independent, sovereign states bound only by this loose treaty called the Articles of Confederation for about 11 years before the new Constitution was drafted and about 12 years before it was actually ratified and about 13 years before it actually went into effect. So the states had been around. There was really no way James Madison was going to convince the Constitutional Convention or the rest of the states to abolish themselves. It simply wasn't going to happen. So the states were a fact. But it was also a fact that Madison welcomed their presence because just as he wanted to divide up the national government into three branches to set them in opposition to each other to make sure that no one branch of the national government became preeminent or tyrannical, he was pleased by the fact that the states were out there as an independent check on the entire national government. In fact, this became particularly important to him later during the, uh, the George Washington presidency and especially the presidency of John Adams when the national government was doing things that were pretty objectionable like the Alien and Sedition Acts and uh, James Madison and his friend Thomas Jefferson actually went out and got Kentucky and Virginia to pass resolutions as state governments protesting this national law. So he looked to the states as an independent check on national power. So all of this is by design. When the Bill of Rights was passed, it was very clearly intended to apply only to the national government. 
In fact, if you look at the debates, the ratification debates leading up to the adoption of the Bill of Rights, uh, one followed from the other. People were concerned about this new powerful central national government. They were scared about it, and they specifically wanted a Bill of Rights to protect them against it. And for the first hundred years or so of our national existence, it was very clear that that was all the Bill of Rights did. But then came along the 14th Amendment, and the 14th Amendment was revolutionary in a number of ways. Uh, for the first time, there was a due process clause that specifically applied to the states. Indeed, the entire 14th Amendment begins, no state shall. It's all about the states being, if you will, burdened with certain restrictions on their freedom of action, which again makes sense in the context because it was the southern states primarily that had slavery and that led to the secession and the Civil War. So the 14th Amendment, no state shall. Well, this due process clause that was included in the 14th Amendment, one of those phrases that's majestic but somewhat ambiguous, uh, has been interpreted, among other things, to incorporate the original Bill of Rights as against the states. That's the magic phrase. What this means is that bit by bit, starting after the Civil War and continuing on to the present day, quite recently actually in the Heller case in 2008, individual provisions of the Bill of Rights will be applied to state governments as well as the national government.